One summer evening in 1919, Bella Wright is pushing her bike home after visiting family. She stands at the top of a road, turns, gives her cousin a big beaming smile before turning on her feet and walking away. 30 minutes later, she would be found dead. What ensued was a months long manhunt for her murderer, one of the most publicised trials of its time and one huge question. Did Ronald Light get away with murder? Make sure you stick around till the end and comment down below and let me know what you think. Hello lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome back to my channel and another true crime case. Thank you so much for being here with me. If you're interested in true crime, please make sure to subscribe because that's what this channel is all about. You can also click the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. Before continuing to watch, please check the description box below for my disclaimer and for any content warnings. Today's case is said to be one of the biggest murder mysteries in British history. It was dubbed the Green Bicycle Murder after the one and only suspect in this case and even today, 104 years later, it is still considered unsolved. I'm True Crime Caitlin and this is the murder of Bella Wright. In Somerby, Leicestershire, Annie Bella Wright was born on the 14th of July, 1897. Everyone always called Annie by her middle name, Bella, so that's what I'm going to do today because that's what she liked to be called. Her father, a man named Kenneth, was a labourer on a farm and her mother, Mary Ann, was a housewife. They weren't a very well-off family at all, they were actually quite poor and would just say getting by. When Bella was two, the family upped and moved to Stoughton, Leicestershire and moved into this cosy cottage. The family began growing and Bella would eventually become the oldest of seven siblings, so cosy cottage quickly turned into cramped cottage. She attended school until she was 12 years old. After that, she began working to try and bring a little bit of extra income in to help support her family. At the time, many families who needed the extra financial support, their children would do that as well. This wasn't an uncommon thing. She worked as a maid for upper class families for several years up until after World War I had broken out. Most of the factory workers at the time were men, so they were being sent off to fight in the war, so women were having to replace them inside of the factories, Bella would find work at a rubber factory. This factory was around five miles away from the family cottage, so in order to get to and from work, Bella would ride her bike. This bike was one of Bella's most prized possessions. She absolutely loved this bike. When she wasn't using it to go to and from work, she would be cycling all around the nearby villages, all around the nearby countryside, and she was just never off this bike. Living in a busy household and having adult responsibilities such as earning a wage and helping to raise her younger siblings, Bella's bike was her escape which allowed her some freedom and some independence which I can imagine felt great. Bella would be described as a shy, quiet girl who was very beautiful and had great character. She was very well liked by everyone who knew her, she was able to retain many friendships and she was even engaged to her childhood sweetheart, a man named Archie Ward. When the war broke out, Bella and Archie had to pause their wedding planning so that he could go and serve his country as a part of the Navy. With her fiancé away at war, Bella would attract a lot of attention from the men who were still at home. One man specifically who was an officer took a real liking to Bella and she even told her mum, Mary Ann, that she thought this man was in love with her, but she wasn't interested, she was all for Archie. On the 5th of July 1919, 21-year-old Bella Wright had just finished a night shift at the rubber factory and cycled home. She slept from around 8.30am up until 4pm. She didn't have work again that night so she had a lovely sleep and then when she did wake up she kind of, you know, had a slow morning, kind of took her time getting up, getting ready and getting sorted for the rest of the afternoon. She spent about half an hour writing a letter to Archie who still wasn't home. Although the war had ended eight months prior, he still wasn't back. He was waiting to be demobilised. You all know I'm not great with army phrases, but I'm pretty sure that demobilised means that he was waiting to be relieved of his military service and allowed to return back home. 
Her plans for that afternoon consisted of going to the post office to post this letter and then she was going to cycle over to nearby Galby to her uncle's house because her cousin and her husband had just had a baby and she wanted to go and visit them. She started getting ready, opting for a pastel blouse, a long skirt, a light rain jacket and a straw hat. As she was outside of the cottage kind of getting ready to cycle down into the town to post this letter she got talking to one of the neighbours. This neighbour offered to take the letter and post it for Bella because they were going that way in anyways and Bella gladly accepted. She was thinking that this is going to shave a little bit of time off her afternoon, she can get to her uncle sooner and spend some more time with them so she handed this letter to the neighbour and was very thankful for them. Bella's uncle, a man named George Measures, lived in Galby which was about four miles away and it would take about 25 minutes to cycle to. On our way there, Bella noticed that our front wheel was a bit slack so she climbed off and started to have a look at it and that's when she noticed that one of the bolts on our front wheel was coming loose. She sighed, probably thinking, great, now she's got a wheel this to George's, which would take much longer and shorten the time of her visit. She wouldn't be able to see the family for as long as she wanted to. She then looked up and noticed a man approaching her. This man was Ronald Light. Ronald Vivian Light was the son of an extremely wealthy family. His father was a civil engineer who managed a colliery and was also a pretty successful inventor. Ronald was born on the 19th of October 1885 and he lived a very privileged life. He wanted for nothing, including affection. Sadly, his mother had had many miscarriages and none of his other siblings survived past infancy, so to his parents, Ronald simply surviving made him the centre of their world. He was very much wrapped up in cotton wool by his mother. He was very much her golden boy who could do nothing wrong. Growing up, Ronald had developed a very disturbing, disgusting interest in younger girls and he was always getting into trouble. In 1902, he was expelled from Orgham School after he forced a young girl to strip in front of him. Thankfully, he was intercepted before anything happened. I would hate to think where Ronald intended that the lead do. Later in his life, when he was in his 30s, he tried to quote, seduce a 15 year old girl and engaged in what he called improper conduct with an eight year old. This was a man in his 30s. What does he want with a 15 year old and an eight year old? I couldn't find if he was punished or went through any rehabilitation for these disgusting predatory things he was trying to do, but he did admit that he'd done them. Despite his expulsion from school, Ronald was able to enrol and graduate from the University of Birmingham as a civil engineer, following in his dad's footsteps. Clearly, Ronald was a very intelligent man. His first job after graduating was as a droughtsman at Derby Locomotive Works. He began working here in 1906 all the way up until 1914 when he was sacked. He was 29 when he was sacked and the reason that they sacked him was because he was graffitiing in the toilets and he was accused of setting fires as well. Not too long after he would be sacked from another job, he'd got a job working on some farm and he was setting fire to the haystacks there so he was quickly sacked from that job as well. When World War I broke out, Ronald saw this as an opportunity to sort of set things right and put his life back on track. Coming from the upper class family he did, his parents were very proud people and his dad especially took it really, really hard when Ronald kept on getting into trouble and kept on losing jobs, tarnishing the family reputation. So when the war broke out, Ronald went off to military training. He would travel from Chatham to Ribbon to Newark for this training. He was eventually commissioned as a second lieutenant and again not great with army phrases so I looked that up and from what I could gather a second lieutenant is sort of like a junior military officer. This only lasted for a single year though because of course Ronald was still getting into trouble. He was demoted of his second lieutenant commission and deranked which meant he just had to serve in the normal ranks from then on. This demotion came after he was accused of sexually assaulting a French woman while he was serving. After the news of his son's day ranking within the army, Ronald's dad fell off of a balcony to his death. Now his death was supposedly an accident, however many believe that he was so full of embarrassment and shame because of Ronald that he had thrown himself over the balcony. 
1917, Ronald was taken to the court martial, which is the army's own court, after it was found that he had been forging move orders. So obviously his attempt at starting fresh and keeping out of trouble was going terribly. After actively serving his country for three years, Ronald was sent back to England on medical grounds. It was deemed that he was suffering from shell shock, we would now call shell shock PTSD, and now he was also partially deaf as well. Ronald described returning from his active service as a broken man. He moved back to Leicester and lived with his mum where he was receiving some psychiatric treatment for his shell shock. On the 5th of July 1919, Ronald was out having a relaxing bike ride all around the different local villages. He would do this daily after being sent home. Now, as I mentioned, Ronald's bike is a very important part of today's case. His bike is the reason that this case was dubbed the Green Bicycle Murder. So Ronald had owned the bike for about eight or nine years at this point and it was very distinct. It was a BSA deluxe model folding bike in the colour pea green and the colour stood out to almost everyone who's seen it as at this time most of the bikes that everyone was riding were just black, coloured bikes were a lot more expensive and not something that a typical person could afford. When ordering the bike, Ronald also requested to have a coaster brake fitted on the back wheel, which was another thing that made this bike very distinct because those brakes were not common either. So on this day, the 5th of July, 1919, Ronald is out and about on his very distinct bike when he comes across a young woman leaning over her own bike. This was Bella Wright. He approached Bella to see what was wrong and he noticed that she was trying to fix the front wheel of her bike. She turned to him and asked him if he happened to have a spanner with him to tighten the bolts, but he didn't. Ronald offered to accompany Bella to her uncle's house. He would mount the bikes and they would both walk there together. She accepted and off they went to Galby. During their walk, many people noticed Bella and Ronald together and the couple struck everyone as sort of an odd pairing. This picture shows how Bella and Ronald may have looked. This was taken from a reenactment of the case. Ronald was 33 and Bella was 21. He was exceptionally well-dressed, kitted out in a full grey suit, including a black tie and black boots. And he's in possession of a really expensive bike. And he's with Bella, who obviously is younger than him. She's wearing kind of cheaper clothing and has quite a standard bike. So seeing these two together did draw attention to people because they looked and seen that these two people were very much the opposite. So seeing them together did strike them as a bit unusual. When Bella arrived at her Uncle George's cottage, she turned to Ronald and said her goodbyes, but I don't think he took it that way. Of course, I don't know her exact words, but she said something along the lines of like, I'll see you later, you know, something like that. And Ronald took it literally and decided to wait outside of George's cottage for hours. From inside the cottage, George was looking out, watching Ronald, and immediately he did not like him. He didn't like his mannerisms, he didn't like how he looked, not necessarily his appearance, but you know when you look at someone and something's not right with them, there's something off. That's how George felt about Ronald. When Bella came inside, George questioned her about this weird man. Who was he? How did she meet him? What was he there for? And she replied to him, quote, Oh, I don't really know him at all. He's been riding alongside me for the past couple of miles, but he isn't bothering me at all. He's just chatting about the weather. Bella would also describe Ronald saying that he was being the perfect gentleman while accompanying her. For the next few hours, Bella enjoyed spending some quality time with her uncle George, her cousin, her cousin's husband, and their new baby. 8.30 p.m. had quickly rolled around and Bella knew that soon the sun was gonna start setting and she wanted to be home before it got dark. So she got up and started to say her goodbyes. The family saw her out the door and once she was out and noticed that Ronald was no longer kind of lingering around waiting for her, she let out a breath that she didn't realise she was holding. She had a wave of relief come over her. However quickly, she sucked a breath back in and that feeling of relief was replaced with the feeling of anxiety when Ronald, from the top of a bank, flew down on his bike and shouted to Bella, quote, Bella, you have been a long time. I thought you had gone the other way. 
he had hidden out the way and was sat watching George's cottage waiting for Bella to re-emerge. This young girl was a complete stranger to Ronald. How weird is it that he sat waiting, lingering around for hours for her to come back out? When Ronald reappeared, Bella's cousin sent her husband out to go and speak to him to try and size him up a little bit to essentially get a feel of his vibe. Meanwhile, she had pulled Bella to the side and expressed her concern about this man's return. Bella was clearly shaken to see that he was back. When she had left the cottage only a couple of seconds before, she was noticeably relieved that he wasn't there, but now he was back, her demeanour just gave off that she felt very uncomfortable and anxious. Bella reassured her cousin that she would be fine and that she was going to try and give him the slip. Bella and Ronald walked away from George's cottage at around 8.50pm, pushing their bikes along Galby Lane. Before they disappeared, Bella turned around and gave a beautiful beaming smile. She waved before turning and continuing to walk away. This would be the last time her family would see her alive. At approximately 9.20pm, a farmer named Joseph Cowell, who was out on an early evening stroll, would find the body of 21-year-old Bella Wright. She was lay sort of half on, half off the road. She was half on her back, half on her side in a bit of a contorted position and her upturned bike was close by. This diagram shows sort of how she was found laying and where her bike was in proximity to her body. She was found close to a gate, which is a small but important detail. On this picture, the X represents where Bella was found and then the arrow is the gate. Bella's face was saturated with fresh blood. She had blood running from her nose and pooling behind her head. When Joseph found Bella, he initially thought that maybe she had collapsed or fainted from exhaustion and hit her head, causing her death. There was no signs of a struggle or anything suspicious to Joseph in any ways. He hastily went to try and find help and this next little bit, sources do differ on what happened, so I'll take you through both. Joseph found Dr. Williams and PC Hall and led them to Bella's body. By now, it's around about 10pm and Bella's parents, Kenneth and Marianne, are frantic. They're very worried that their oldest daughter hasn't returned home and outside, it's getting darker and darker by the minute. While Kenneth and Marianne are worrying about where Bella is, Dr. Williams is conducting a candlelit examination of her body. Very quickly, he determined that Bella's cause of death was from an accidental head injury and instructed Joseph and PC Hall to help him in moving our body from this road to a nearby abandoned cottage. They would leave her there till morning and in the morning they would work on identifying her and then notifying the family of her death. So together, the three men picked up Bella's body and transported to this abandoned cottage. Once there, they lay Bella on the cold, wet, dark floor and left her there all alone. The other version of events is still that Joseph had found Bella's body while he was out on an evening stroll. He went to find help and found help in some other people who were out walking on this road and it was one of these people that recognised the girl as Bella Wright from the rubber factory. Together all of these people helped in carrying Bella's dead body from Galby Lane to her home which again was about four miles away. And once she was returned back home, that is when PC Hall and Dr. Williams arrived and Dr. Williams confirmed that Bella had died due to an accidental head injury. Again, I couldn't find exactly which one of these is the correct one. Sources do differ. However, I do believe that it's the former, just based off other stuff that happens as the case goes on. Naturally, everyone agreed with Dr. Williams' ruling. He was the doctor, he knew what he was on about. However, PC Hall wasn't as convinced. He just had this gut instinct. He had a feeling that something was off, something wasn't right. So the next morning at the crack of dawn, PC Hall went back down to where Bella's body was found and conducted his own more thorough investigation. He'd done a fingertip search, a fingertip search meaning he was literally on his hands and knees crawling around looking for evidence. And around five metres away from where Bella's body was lay, he found the shell casing of a 
five caliber bullet. It was found under a horse's hoof print and embedded into the mud, but immediately upon seeing it, PC Hall knew that this was no coincidence and that this bullet had something to do with Bella's death. So almost immediately, he raced back to where Bella was, either in the abandoned cottage or at her parents' house. He extremely carefully washed away the blood that was all dry and crusted on her face and there he found a single small bullet sized wound just above Bella's left cheekbone. This young girl hadn't fallen or collapsed or fainted and died, this young girl had been murdered. Dr Williams was rapidly brought back to conduct another full examination of Bella and I really don't understand why it was him to be brought back. Obviously he was very lazy or he was oblivious to not thoroughly examine Bella the first time. He didn't thoroughly examine her because PC Hall is the one that cleaned the blood from her face to find the bullet wound. So why they brought Dr Williams back, I don't know. Maybe he was the only man for the job. After this examination, he concluded that Bella had died after sustaining a single gunshot wound entering the left side of her face and exiting the right side of her head. It was estimated that this shot was fired at quite close range from about six to seven foot distance and that apart from this one single lethal wound, Bella had no other signs of harm or injury or anything to indicate a struggle, so no cuts, bruises, grazes, nothing like that. Police promptly began an investigation and started by interviewing everyone that they could in Bella's life. This included her family, her friends, employer, co-workers, anyone she'd spoke to or anyone that had seen her that day. They were just talking to anyone that they could. They wanted as much information about Bella Wright as possible. From these interviews, they were able to determine that they were looking for a man who owned a green bicycle. Tons of people had seen Bella with this man on the day of her murder. They recognised Bella because she was well liked, she was well known, she'd lived in this area almost all of her life and she was accompanied by a man that they didn't recognise. He was described as being between 35 and 40 years old, between 5'7 and 5'9, having a broad face and wearing a grey suit. From all of these interviews that police were doing, they discovered that this mystery man that they were looking for had spoken to and tried to pursue two other much younger girls earlier in the day that Bella had been murdered. Muriel Mummy, who was 14, and Valeria Cavan, who were 12, were best friends who were out on a bike ride together. They were going along a road that was taking them out of Leicester, and on this road, they crossed paths with a man who was cycling in the opposite direction. Spoiler alert, this man was Ronald. Ronald looked at these two young girls who were alone and he smiled at them as they rode past. He continued cycling for a little bit before spinning on his bike and began to follow them. Knowing this man's history with young girls, it's terrifying to think what he was probably thinking and anticipating in that moment. He caught up to Muriel and Valera and started conversing with them, asking, what's your name? Where are you going? What are you doing today? You know, like that sort of thing. And this really creeped both of the girls out. So both of them spun around on their bikes and cycled away as quickly as they could. When relaying this interaction onto the police, the description that both girls gave police of this man almost perfectly matched the description that everyone else gave of the man that was with Bella so it was really safe to assume that both of these men were the same person both of these men we knew were Ronald so it's likely that after Muriel and Valera had took off after they had pedaled away from Ronald he continued on this path and that is when he came across Bella Wright Officers knew that the key to this whole investigation lay in that bike, the pea green bike. If they could track down the owner of this bike, they may potentially find Bella Wright's killer. News of Bella's murder and the investigation was the headline of every magazine, every newspaper, everywhere, up and down the country, everybody was talking about Bella Wright and police used this to their advantage, broadcasting this small article detailing the man that they were looking for as well as a description of the bike. Despite all the news coverage and police really doing everything that they could, no one came forward and no one ever spotted the bike again. Sadly, after this, the murder investigation rapidly began to go cold. 
because Bella's murder was so publicised and was getting so much attention, it was all that anyone spoke about. People were talking about Bella constantly when they were at work, when they were in the pubs, even when they were in church. It was from his mother and their maid, a woman named Mary Elizabeth Webb, that Ronald realised just how big the case was. Within a few days, he started to realise that he was in the shit. He was the prime suspect of this huge murder case and the media and the public had already convicted this mystery man with the green bicycle and he really began to panic. In order to cover his tracks, he began concealing and getting rid of any and all evidence that tied him to Bella. That full grey suit that he had worn that day, he sold onto somebody else. He stopped keeping his bike in the kitchen downstairs. He moved it up to the attic and never got it back out. And then after that, he stayed very quiet and just laid low. He made no attempts to go to police to say, I'm the man with the green bicycle, how can I help? He made no attempts to clear his name or even try and aid in the investigation because if he wasn't the killer, maybe he knew some information that could lead police to the killer. He didn't do any of that, which you think a, an innocent person would do. Ronald kept his bike in the attic up until he felt that the investigation had sort of toned down or cooled down a little bit. He brought the bike down sometime in October and started to dismantle it. He scrubbed the serial number off of the frame of the bike so that it couldn't be traced back to him. After doing this, he then took the dismantled bike to the Upperton Road Bridge and began throwing the, all of the dismantled parts into the river. The only part that he kept was the back wheel because again, that had the course to break on the back which was very distinct to his bike so he kept that and just tossed everything else. Ronald would later say that during this period of time he was worried all of the time and he was living with really high anxiety so likely because of this because of him wanting to get away from all of this he took up a job as a maths teacher in a school over 90 miles away in Cheltenham. This actually makes me think now that Ronald mustn't have got into any trouble for being a predator for being a paedophile for what he had done before because surely he can't be going getting a job in a school if he's a danger to children unless they didn't have dbs's back then i don't know on the 23rd of february 1920 seven months after bella's murder a barge that was sailing on the leicester canal got its towing rope stuck on something the man working on the barge was sort of pulling on this rope trying to free it from whatever it was snagged on and on doing so he pulled up the frame of a green bike. Luckily this man had been extensively following the case of Bella's murder so as soon as he pulled this green bike frame on board immediately he knew what it was and contacted the police. Over the next few days, officers dredged the canal, scouring for the other dismantled parts of the bike, and luckily, they were able to find everything, of course, apart from that back wheel, because that wasn't dumped. During this investigation, they also found an army-issued holster, which is just like a gun pocket, and they also found a box of bullets. This box of bullets was the exact type of bullet that was used to kill Bella. Finding all of this evidence, police finally thought that they had had a big break. However, they would be disappointed to find that the serial number, which they so desperately needed, had been filed off of the bike. Thankfully, however, the company who made the bikes, BSA, they were able to take in the frame of the bike and examine it somehow and they were able to work out what the serial number of this bike was. This bike had been ordered to a shop in Leicester in 1910 and this shopkeeper kept very meticulous records of each and every sale. So because of this, they were able to give the police the name of the man who purchased the bike. And that man was Ronald Light. On the 4th of March 1920, two officers arrived at Dean Close School to question Ronald's involvement with Bella and to tell him that the green bike they had found had led them to him. They asked him, quote, You had a green bike? What became of it? Ronald immediately began to lie. He completely denied ever using, owning or buying a green bicycle. 
when he was presented with the receipt that he had signed confirming that he had bought that green bicycle from that man in that shop in 1910, Ronald sort of went like, oh, like that bike. Like, I didn't know you were talking about that bike, you know, like that. He told the officers that bike, that green bike that he'd forgotten about, he'd sold to an army officer in either 1916 or 1919. And he tried to justify his lying, saying that he bought and sold so many bikes that it was hard to keep track of them all and that he must have just forgotten. A quick thing I noticed there as well, I don't know if you might have picked up on it or not, but when I was researching I noticed, so Ronald just said there that he sold this to a British army officer and now he knows police have found the bike so he's probably putting two and two together thinking if they found the bike have they found the holster, have they found the bullets, which we know that yes they have but Ronald doesn't know that yet I don't think. So is he now saying that he sold it to a British army officer because he knows that holster is army issued. So if police are looking into it, it would make sense for a British army officer to have an army issued holster. Is this him sort of already planting the seed of his innocence? Is he already trying to cover his tracks and deflect? I'm not sure, but I definitely thought that that was interesting and something that I wanted to mention. While speaking to officers, his demeanour was described as relaxed and calm. He didn't even twitch, break a sweat or seem worried at all. His attitude though was very different to that. He very much looked down to the officers. He spoke down to them, spoke to them as if they were stupid and didn't know what they were on about. He thought that he was better than them and he wasn't bothered about treating them how he thought they should be treated. He had no problem showing that he thought he was better than them is essentially what I'm trying to say. The two officers weren't satisfied with Ronald's answers, so they arrested him on suspicion of murder, escorted him out of the school and took him down to the station for further questioning. While Ronald was being held and questioned, other police got to work speaking to all the people within his close circle like how they had for Bella's months prior. Mary Elizabeth Webb, who again was the family's maid, said that on the night of Bella's murder, the 5th of July 1919, Ronald had got home well after 10pm, which was extremely unlike him, and on the night she questioned him why he was so late, but he explained it away, saying that he had a flat tyre or he had a puncture and that he had to walk home. He was stood in a lineup, and he was pointed out by several people, including Bella's uncle George, as the person that was with Bella on the night of her murder. Presented with this and other things as well, Ronald did sort of break a little bit but not like fully, he was only giving away little hints. So he told police that yes he was the man that accompanied Bella that night, he had approached her after he saw she was having some trouble with her bike, he then accompanied her to her Uncle George's cottage, he had waited for her, he had walked away with her but he was adamant that he was not the person who murdered her. He said that once they both reached Golby Lane, he went one way, Bella went the other, and that was it. He never seen her or heard from her again, up until he heard his mother and Mary talking about her, saying that Bella had been murdered. When asked why he didn't come forward earlier, he told police that his mom was very unwell and he didn't want to stress her, he didn't want to upset her by her son being the prime suspect in this massive murder investigation. Following extensive questioning and given all the evidence that they had, police felt confident and they charged Ronald Light with the murder of Bella Wright. His trial began at Leicester Courthouse on the 8th of June 1920 and this trial would be one of the most sensationalised, publicised trials of its time. A murder mystery where the accused is a rich, attractive man, not someone that you would look at and go like, yeah, he looks like a killer. Ronald was not like that. Throughout the trial, newspapers would do a daily updates and within these, they portrayed Ronald as a gentleman, a teacher, an ex-army officer. They really liked Ronald, thus putting him up on a pedestal, whereas when they spoke about Bella, who again is the victim, they referred to her as simply, quote, 
a factory girl and they even questioned her intentions and morals by allowing a man to walk with her. Bella was not just a factory girl, she was someone's daughter, someone's sister, someone's niece, cousin, auntie. She was someone who had her whole life ahead of her. She had her own goals, her own dreams, her own aspirations. She was going to get married. She was possibly going to have her own family. She had her own full life that she had to look forward to and that was ripped away from her. She was not just a factory girl, she was a human being and quite frankly it's disgusting that the major completely erased who Bella was and stripped her of her humanity yet they put Ronald up on a pedestal. Hundreds of people would arrive outside the courthouse every single day desperate to get a space inside to witness one of the biggest trials of their time. A lot of these people were women who were admirers of Ronald. Because his family were absolutely lauded, they were able to get the best defence lawyer that money could buy. A man who was dubbed the Great Defender, Sir Edward Marshall Hall. The prosecution believed that they had an open and shut case. They alleged that Ronald had gone out on that day, July 5th, 1919, specifically looking for someone to have relations with. And of course, because he is a paedophile and a predator, he went out scoping specifically for young girls. So when he came across Muriel and Valera, they were perfect for him. But after they had peddled away, he continued on and that is when he found a lone young woman who we know was Bella. After leaving George's cottage, the prosecution believed that for whatever reason, maybe Bella declining a sexual advances from Ronald, that she ran away from him scared, and Ronald, who has now been declined three times and he's getting a little bit sick, chased after her, pushed her to the floor, and using one of his old service guns, shot her in the face and killed her. He then fled from the scene, probably only minutes before Joseph Cowell, that farmer, came across Bella's body. Many witnesses were called to testify that the man that they had seen with Bella on the night of her murder was the defendant, including her uncle George. Muriel and Valera were called to testify that the person who had followed them while they were riding their bikes was the defendant. The prosecution really doubled down that at every single step of this investigation, Ronald had lied through his back teeth up until he was forced to be truthful. For example, he completely denied owning or having a green bike up until he was presented with the receipt that had his signature on. He completely denied being the man that accompanied Bella that night up until numerous witnesses had identified him. So he was a serial liar. What else is he lying about? They also really hammered that Ronald had tried his best to tamper and dispose of anything that tied him to the crime. Obviously, he hid the bike. He then dismantled it and dumped it into the river but he went the extra mile to file off the serial number. The prosecution were really trying to create an image inside of the jury's head. They wanted the jury to see past the very composed man that sat in front of them. They wanted the jury to see the liar, the manipulator, the person who went to great lengths to interfere with evidence, the person who moved away to try and evade police and lay law. They wanted the jury to see this man as the person that murdered Bella Wright. When questioned about the events of the 5th of July 1919, Ronald flat out denied ever meeting or interacting with either Muriel or Valera. When he was asked about how he came to meet Bella Wright, he responded, quote, This is a long quote, so I am just going to read directly from it. She looked up and asked me if I could lend her a spanner. I had no spanner with me. I just looked at the bicycle and saw there was a certain amount of play on the free wheel. I could do nothing to it, and we rode on together down a steep hill. We dismounted at the bottom and walked up another. We remounted and rode onto a village which she told me was Galby. She told me that she was going to visit some friends and when we came to the cottage she said it would only be 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour. I took this as a suggestion that I should wait. I waited a quarter of an hour and then decided to go back to Leicester but I found that my back tyre was flat. I repaired the puncture and found that it was quarter past eight. I thought I would go back to see where the young girl had got to and saw her coming out of her friend's house. So I called to her, hello, you've been a long time. I thought you had gone the other way. 
So that's Ronald's version of events. There is a huge debate over when Ronald had called to Bella, if he called her by name or if he did say hello. Ronald is the only one that claims he said hello and everybody else that was there, obviously apart from poor Bella, so Bella's uncle George, her cousin and her cousin's husband, all distinctly remember Ronald shouting, Bella, you have been a long time. In that statement as well, Ronald also said that Bella had told him that she was gonna go visit her friends when that wasn't true either. She was going to visit her family. Ronald continued his statement saying, quote, we pushed our bicycles up the hill to the other road and when we came to it, we got on them again. When we came to the junction of the upper and lower roads, I kept to the right on the upper road. The girl got off her bike and I got off mine. I must say goodbye to you here. I'm going that way, she said, pointing to the road on the left. Isn't this way the shorter way to Leicester, I asked her. I don't live there, she said. I answered. Well, I must go this way, for I am late already, and with this puncture, I may have to walk half the way home. We said goodbye without shaking hands, and when I last saw her, she was just starting to move off down the lower road. And he denied ever seeing her again after that. While testifying, he admitted that he was the owner of the green bicycle and that once he learned that police were actively searching for the bike and the owner, he hid it until he felt comfortable enough to dispose of it. He also admitted to filing off the serial number and he also admitted that he was the one that dumped the army issued holster and the box of bullets. He even admitted that he only filed off the serial number because if the bike were to be found, he didn't want it to be traced back to him. When he was asked, why he didn't just come forward when he knew that police were looking for him, he replied, quote, when Bella Wright was murdered, I knew from the newspaper reports that she was the girl that I had been with just before she died. I knew police wanted to question me. I became a coward again. I never told a living soul what I knew. Ronald had always claimed that at the time of Bella's murder, he wasn't in possession of a gun and obviously she was murdered with a gun. He did admit that he did once own a revolver. However, he became separated from it when he returned home from his military service. That is not the entire truth, however, depending on who you believe. A woman was called to the stand and this woman was Ronald's ex-partner and she contradicted his statement about not having possession of a gun. She said that in 1916, when I believe that Ronald was still serving in France, he had sent a parcel to her with strict instructions to not open it, so she didn't. When he returned to Leicester much later, the two met up and she handed him this still wrapped parcel. She hadn't peeked at it, anything. She handed it over to him and he unwrapped it in front of her. And that is when she realized that inside this parcel was a gun. She was very upset that she had basically been a safekeeper for this weapon and she had said that if she knew what was inside this box, she would have never accepted it. So either she is completely fabricating this whole story, someone who has no reason to lie, she's not benefiting from this lie, or Ronald, who has every reason to lie, is lying. Mary Elizabeth Webb testified how on the night of Bella's murder, Ronald got home a lot later than he normally would. When she asked him about this, he told her that he had a puncture and that he had to walk home. So he came home, propped his bike up in the kitchen, had a bite to eat and went up to bed as if nothing had happened. His behaviour, his attitude, nothing was different. Ronald was just the exact same as he was every other night. She also noted that Ronald was partial to a daily bike ride. Ever since he came home from serving in the army, he would go on a bike ride every single day. But after this night, he never went on one again. Ronald's defence, Sir Edward Marshall Hall, aka the Great Defender, really tried to discredit each and every one of the prosecution's witnesses. He said that Muriel and Valera were untrustworthy witnesses because they were so young and that they saw that the man they claimed was Ronald over a year ago. So Edward challenged this, saying that their memories likely altered over time, so you can't trust them. He used the complete opposite on George though, Bella's uncle George. Remember, George, Bella's cousin, his husband, all distinctly remember Ronald calling Bella by her name, but Edward Marshall Hall said, no, that's not right. George is just old so he'll have misremembered or he'll have misheard or he's just forgotten and just presumed that he said Bella. 
I think that the straw that broke the camel's back in regards to Ronald's defence was when Edward cross-examined the gunsmith who was one of the prosecution's witnesses. The gunsmith had testified to say that the bullets that were found in the river, the ones that Ronald admitted to dumping, matched perfectly in size, shape, brand, everything to the bullet that had murdered Bella. Edward questions the gunsmith and he says if Ronald had shot Bella at such a close range, if you remember it was estimated to have been between six and seven foot, wouldn't it have caused more damage than just one singular wound? Wouldn't it have, in Edward's words, blown her head off? The gunsmith said maybe. It depended on a lot of factors including velocity, how it was shot, if anything interfered with the bullet from it leaving the gun to strike in Bella. There was a lot of factors in the middle of it. Edward pushed and pushed and pushed and sort of got the gunsmith to agree that yes it was technically possible for the bullet to have ricocheted off of something and then strike Bella however it was extremely unlikely. When the gunsmith agreed to this Edward hammered the idea that Ronald didn't kill Bella, a farmer did or young boys who were out shooting did and that all of this was just a tragic accident. Now do you remember the crow I told you to remember earlier on? If you don't don't worry the crow was found dead in proximity to to Bella's body. So Edward now has a new theory that this crow was sat on top of the gate and some young boys nearby used it as sort of a target that they had shot the crow and then the bullet either ricocheted after striking the crow and diverted to hit Bella or it went straight through the crow and then hit Bella then. Ronald didn't kill Bella, these boys shooting this crow did. That is what Edward is going with now. Edward claimed that the only thing that Ronald done was not come forward to police when he should have and that technically that is not a crime and that all of the prosecution's evidence against Ronald was purely circumstantial. Edward spoke to the jury and asked them why would Ronald even want to kill Bella? Why would this well-spoken upstanding citizen who served his country and now taught children want to kill a factory girl? What was his motive? Bella wasn't robbed, she wasn't raped, sexually assaulted, beaten. They didn't know each other, so they didn't have any sort of bad blood for him to be motivated to kill her. What was his motive? Why would he want to kill this girl? Edward was almost making it out as if Ronald was too good to kill Bella. Why would he want to kill a girl like her? That's what he was trying to get across, which I just don't understand. He made it sound like Ronald was an angel and was too good to murder someone like Bella whatever that means. One thing I noticed when researching the trial is that no one brought up Ronald's past and his disgusting predatory behaviour towards minors and women and people he felt like he could control. Surely if this was brought up somewhere it would erase the golden boy upstanding perfect citizen image that Sir Edward Marshall Hall was putting in the jury's heads. Surely if they would have known this information they would have considered him a little bit different. They wouldn't have looked at him the same same way but no one brought that up. The jury deliberated for only three hours before returning with their verdict. They found Ronald Light not guilty of the murder of Annie Bella Wright. When this was read out in court the gallery erupted. People stood up cheering and these people weren't even like Ronald's friends or family. They had somehow in a sick and twisted way become his fans. So when they heard the not guilty verdict they rose out of their seats and they began cheering when Bella's family who are absolutely devastated they know that Ronald is the man that has killed their loved one. They're sat in the gallery listening to these people cheering that he got a not guilty verdict. That's just absolutely devastating. Three days after his acquittal, Ronald returned back to the police station to collect his belongings. While here, he bumped into someone he considered a friend. This was Superintendent of Leicestershire Police, Levi Borley. According to Levi, Ronald made a full confession to him. Ronald fully confessed to murdering Bella Wright. Now that he was protected by the double jeopardy law, he felt safe enough to do this. Ronald told Levi that he wanted Levi to know the truth because he really valued him as a friend. After Ronald left, Levi went on to type up exactly what Ronald had told him and it read in part quote, I did shoot the girl but it was completely accidental. We were riding quietly along. 
I had my revolver in my raincoat pocket and we dismounted for her to look at it. I had no idea there was a loaded cartridge in it. Her hand was out to take it when it went off. She fell and never stirred. I got on my bicycle and rode away. The authenticity of this statement has been challenged because it's literally Levi's word against Ronald's word. So take that however you please. But I am interested to know whether you think this is true. Did Ronald make a full confession to Levi? Ronald went on to quietly live with his mother up until 1928 when he upped and moved over 150 miles away to Laysdown on Sea, which is near Kent. When he moved here, he changed his name, no longer going by Ronald Light, he now went by the name Leonard Estelle. Despite his move though, Ronald never changed his ways. It was said that he would be in trouble with the police at least another three times. One of these incidences included inappropriate conduct towards a woman and a child. In 1934, he married a woman named Lillian Lester and the couple had no children. He would die at the age of 89 in 1975. Bella was laid to rest on the 11th of July 1919 and hundreds of people attended her funeral to pay their respects. Because of the publicity that her case received, many people really felt like they knew Bella and really developed a bond with her and they were really sad and emotional on this day, which you can expect. Her coffin was almost completely covered in flowers and wreaths reflecting how much people loved her. And that is today's case. So what do you all think? Did Ronald get away with murder? Did he kill Bella? Or was Bella truly in the wrong place at the wrong time and was shot from someone in the distance? If you believe that Ronald killed Bella, do you think that it was a sexual motive? Did he make an advance on her and when she declined, did he then murder her in a furious rage? Or was it a power trip? Or what do you think his motive would be? Or do you believe what he told Levi, that he was showing Bella the gun and that it went off accidentally while she was looking at it? Or do you think something else happened? Comment down below and let me know what you think. I am really interested because so many people have so many different ideas and thoughts on what happened. Thank you all so much for sitting and listening with me today. If you like this video and you would like to watch another true crime case covered by me, I have plenty on my channel that are ready for you to all go and watch right now. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe and to click the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. I also cover true crime in shorter form over on my TikTok account. You can find the link for that in the description box below. And I have also linked a Google Doc form down there as well well if you have any suggestions for cases you would like me to cover on my youtube channel make sure you fill that out and i will take all of your suggestions into consideration so yeah i'm gonna leave today's case at that one thank you all so much again for sitting and listening with me and i will see you all on my next one